Today we're going to tackle one of the most difficult areas in cycling, the issue of crank length. The issue of crank length is much misunderstood and it's really not as complicated as it sounds. However, there are a lot of caveats in here, a lot of catches that are easy to misrepresent. So we're going to have a look at these one by one. First thing to think about is, do we really need cranks that are 172.5 millimeters? 172.5 millimeters is a convention. You buy a bike, you don't really think about it. It's in a medium, you get on, you just start pedaling, you get used to that crank length. You adjust the seat height for the crank length and everything seems fine. But is that really the optimum crank length? Is that the optimum for your height? Is that the optimum for your leg length? The chances are it's not. Further, does the crank length have any relationship between the power, the torque, your cadence? It must do. It must do because the crank length is an integral part of bike mechanics. If we start from the basics, if you think about a crank length of, let's say, 170 millimeters versus 160, or 175 versus 165, that's a 6% difference. A 6% difference is the equivalent of going from a 53 chain ring here to a compact 50 chain ring. So all things being equal, the crank length will affect your gearing. In fact, arguably, you should gear your bike according to your crank length. In fact, of course, you should do that. The crank length, once you put the cranks on the bike, is fixed, but your gearing is under your control. So of course, you should adjust the gearing to the crank length. But usually, online calculators don't show you the effect of crank length. We can have a look at that. Now, if you think about the relationship between the force on the pedal and the torque at the hub, the torque is equal to the force times the distance, where the distance is effectively a lever. So a long crank is going to enable you to have more torque if the um, force stays fixed. And what does that mean in practical terms? Well, that, what that means is when you're pedaling in a certain gear, for example, a fixed speed bike where the gearing is fixed, a relatively long crank is going to give you more torque at the hub. In other words, it's relatively easier to turn around compared to, let's say, a crank which was arguably half the length, which would be almost impossible to turn around. In other words, almost impossible to, to generate the same torque relative to the force applied. So the crank length does affect the torque at the hub. And all things being equal, if you're struggling with your gearing, you want to generate more torque, then a longer crank would seem to be more logical. However, there is a problem here, which is that a long crank requires a greater distance around the circle that you pedal. In fact, a 160 millimeter crank would require about a one meter circle whereas a 177.5 crank would require 1 meter 10, in other words, 10 centimeter further travel going from those extreme lengths. Now, if you think about the relationship between power, the power generated, and the rate of cycling, or the cadence, the power is equal to the torque times the cadence or RPM. So if we think about this relationship for a second, if your cadence stays the same but your torque is higher, then you're generating more power. But if your torque stays the same and the power was the same, but the crank length changes, let's say the crank length gets longer, then your cadence must increase because the distance around the axis is longer. So your cadence would have to be faster to make up for it. If you had a short crank on the other hand, your cadence could be relatively slower. That makes sense. That's also why if you have a very long crank, it's relatively difficult to get up to speed very quickly. Whereas if you have a very short crank, it's relatively easy to get up to speed. And scientific studies show that 
going from a 165 to 175 millimeter crank, it takes about 0.5 of a second longer to get up to speed. Okay, can we put some numbers on this question of crank length and gear ratio? Well, yes, we can. If we take a typical wheel of 700 cc, the radius is actually around 340 millimeters. Divide that by your crank length of, let's take the 170 for convenience, then you've got a nice round figure of a ratio of the two of 2.0. Times that by your front chain ring, let's say you're in a 53, divide it by your cassette, let's say you're in a 19, and you get an overall final gear ratio of 5.5. And we can then calculate that if you change out your, ch your cranks to 160s, in other words, you go to 6% or more shorter cranks, then to maintain that final gear ratio, the same gear ratio would require a front chain ring of 50 teeth. In other words, to compensate for the reduction in torque, we need to have a smaller front chain ring. Or if you're in small, on small cranks already and you go up by 6 or so percent, you can effectively gear up, you'll be able to push the equivalent of a 53 on the front rather than a 50. And for completeness, if we were in the, on the inner chain ring there, 39, and let's say on the back going uphill, we were going up 23 on the cassette, then our final gear ratio would be around 3.4 in the, in the 170 cranks. And if we reduce to the 160s, we would effectively need a 36 to be in the same final gear ratio. Okay, that's useful information, but there's something else to consider, which is the question of fit and the, fact, the question of when, how much does fit influence power. The, the bike fit is, is really centrally focused around the cranks. So if you've got your cranks at 180, 0 and 180, top and bottom, saddle height is very, very much closely related to that bottom crank distance. The top crank distance is effectively how much bend is in your knee. That angle there, the uh, femur to lower leg, tibia angle. The reason that's important is that assuming that there was minimal bend on the, on the knee, pretend that my um, arm is the, is the knee for a second. If you're moving up and down with minimal angle you're effectively not contracting and stretching the muscle. So it's relatively, it's relatively difficult to generate high power without full, a full range of movement around that joint. In other words, it's a bit like Bruce Lee's one inch punch. It's almost impossible to generate power without contraction in an effectively isometric movement. However, too much movement around the knee potentially augments knee problems. So you have to be careful to choose a balance between too little and too much movement. Too much movement around the crank, in other words, too large cranks, feel like it's always a strain to go around that bigger circle. Too little movement feels like you're moving in little circles and that you, you can't really generate much force around that little circle. When you initially change cranks, you are very much aware of the, distance, of the difference. So if you do change, and I would highly recommend you do try different crank lengths. That's the ultimate arbiter of comfort then give it a few rides, three to five decent rides, before you make up your mind. And saddle height there, I forgot to say, is effectively determined by that total leg extension there. Because you know, you don't want to lock out your leg when reaching the bottom of the pedal revolution. So you can see the effect of long versus short cranks. It's actually a combination of the contraction effect at the top and the um, stretch to the bottom. Neither one should be out of a comfortable range. Okay, so let's just ask the question whether this makes a difference in the real world. Returning to our question of power, power equals torque times cadence, it is true that although a bigger crank will enable you to generate more force, you're required to pedal faster because of the increasing distance involved. And pedaling faster, the requirement to pedaling faster takes slightly more oxygen, which compensates for the change in torque. So basically there is a balance and scientific studies show that outside of extremes and people have tested as shorter cranks as 120 and as long as 220 um, millimeters, 
outside of those extremes, in that middle range around 170, the power um, effect of changing the crank is relatively modest, one, two or three percent, because of this close relationship between distance travelled or cadence and the torque. However, there is an exception to that, which is when you run out of gears. And you run out of gears either on a fixie or when you're in your, let's say, lowest gear. So if you're on your 39 chainring on the inside, on the front chainring, and you're, you're on your, let's say, 28 on the rear, then you're basically in your lowest gear. And if you're struggling to develop enough power in your lowest gear, there's nowhere to go. And this is where, potentially, a long crank could be an advantage because, as we've seen, you get more leverage from that long crank. But in all other situations, through all other gears, your internal gear choice should effectively compensate for the change in, in crank length. That's the situation for long cranks. Let's say you have short, uh, you want to put on short cranks, and you're in the opposite situation, which is on your, when you're on your 53 or above, and you're on your 11 at the back, and you're going as fast as you can, but you're effectively spinning out. The gear is not difficult enough, so presumably you're on a steep downhill there. This is where um, relatively short cranks would theoretically be an advantage. So these are the situations where the crank has an influence on the power and the ability to do the course in the way you want. Okay, that's everything I can tell you about crank length for now. It's a much misunderstood area. It's an area which you should pay more attention to. Don't just accept the crank length that comes with your bike. Have a look now what length is on there and ask yourself, um, is this information going to help you either get more comfortable on the bike or choose better gears? Thanks for watching, guys. Have a good ride.